Okay, everybody, we are meeting with the Aronsons, Evelyn and Lawrence, though I know them as Larry. Um, and they have been exciting, significant collectors in the Chicago area for a long time and have um, a, a very powerful collection are intimately involved in the arts. So maybe we should start with this question, you guys. Why, why did you start collecting? Why did we start collecting? Um, I had to. Um, I was eight years old. These artists who have to make art, you had to. No, I was eight years old. My parents worked 16, 18 hours a day. We had a encyclopedia Britannic in the house. I opened it up to A, art. I saw uh, Botticelli's Venus on the half shell, and I said, um, this is Technicolor. I lived a very gray life, and this was Technicolor. And from that, I got an interest. I then was taken to the Art Institute uh, when I was 10 years old, saw a, um, a, a Peter Bloom painting. I, I knew, of course, he was dead because he was in the Art Institute. I now find mm -hmm. out he's about uh, six or eight years older than I am. Um, but no, we when we get, when we got married, Evelyn and I, uh, we've been going together 63 years. Uh, we went to high school and college together. Um, I asked her if it would be possible. Uh, would she go along with me? I wanted to put an art collection together, and we took a percentage of our income for the last 55 years. And we put it in art. We now have 600 works of art by 118 artists. Uh, about 90% of them are either teachers at the School of the Art Institute uh, or uh, heads of art departments in most of the major universities in the Midwest and mostly all from Chicago. The few people, artists that are not from Chicago, uh, are people who know Chicago artists or work in the same vein. How did you how did you come to focus? Let's ask Evelyn. How did you guys come to focus on a collection or on an aesthetic or a direction? Well, we started out buying what we liked, but we looked a lot and looked a lot in the years when we started. We started out at the art fairs, and then one day we were at an art fair a couple of years in a row and couldn't find anything but sort of like an artist. And someone said to us, "Well, I have a gallery." A gallery? We didn't know what that was, and we went to our first gallery. And when you say art out, fairs, you mean more like street fairs, or not like the art fairs that we come to know today? Old Town Art Fair, Hyde Fair, High Park Art Fair, 57th Street, and stuff like that. Then we got to the galleries, and then we were buying things that we liked and looking. And in those years, you could go and look and look. You didn't have to buy the minute you saw something. And we began going uh, ongoing, uh, and we started buying what we liked. and we had a colonial house with colonial papers, and we put the art up that we bought on the colonial papers. Chandeliers, wallpaper, tables, early American furniture. Uh, we, we had a, we bought a gym nut, and we put the gym nut up over flocked wallpaper. Uh, but, but Basically, what it, our collection took heart in 1980 when we had a lot of art and we didn't have a lot of space for it, and we wanted to remodel our house. And that's when everything really changed and when we saw we had a collection. And he speaks better than I do, so I'll let him finish. Go well, on. I was a member of the New York Stock Exchange. And one day, somebody said to me, have you been to Soho? There's a lot of great art there. And I said, well, I said to Evelyn, maybe we ought to go to England and we'll, we'll go to Soho. And he said, oh, no, no, Soho in New York. And I said, where is it? And he told me, and I said, I've been going there for 10 years. I didn't know it had a name. <laughs> but we found out early that we weren't going to have a great New York art collection because New York collectors got to the art before we could. So we decided to buy art in Chicago because – are you there? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it freezes, but, yeah, we're still here and I can see you. Okay. Uh, so we decided to buy art in Chicago because we could go to the studios, we could buy – while they were painting them, wow. we, could, wet. we could see all kinds of shows. We now have gone to, I would imagine, because time goes by, we've been collecting almost 55 years. We've been to over 5,000 shows, lectures, 
uh, or something to do with the art over the last 55 years. And have you learned anything? Have you learned anything? Have you learned anything? We learn every time, and in fact, we will go to the same person's lecture two or three times because they're never the same lecture. I know. I give the same talk, and it's always different. Right. It's always different. We went to a show and didn't see anything we liked in our show. Months later, we went to another art show at the same gallery. We walked in the back and saw a painting that was stunning, and we said, oh, my God, we like that painting. When did it come in? She said, it was in the show a month ago. But when we saw 30 paintings together, it didn't stand out. When it was alone, it became very significant. So that happens. And a lot of it has happened by accident. Uh, walk into a gallery, a painting sitting on the floor. I've seen it in a museum show. Who owns it? Nobody. Never sold. We bought it. Things like that happen. Going back to what you asked us about how our collection got where it was. We remodeled our house in 1980 and took everything down and put it away. Cleaned the whole house up with everything that was whatever. It became sleek and modern and no dado, no chandeliers, all whatever. And we had all the art put away. And when we took it out, our architect was very active in the art community and knew art. He was a friend of an artist that we collected by the crowd. And George looked at what we had and said, oh my God, you have a real collection here. And he took everything out and showed us what we have. And at that point, we decided to make it from that point on, fill in and really make it a collection, which is how we got there. Everything had a sensibility that was, I guess, narrative. It, it spoke to the other paintings in, in the house. And so for the last 30 years, we've been buying paintings that speak to the paintings we have. So we no longer have control over what we do, our collection has taken over. But it expands because there are other things we've gone into. We've had the images, we have tattoo art. It works in. We're collecting. Circus 10 signs. The feeling is the same, but we can, you know, stretch our boundaries because we're the collector. And, and, and one of the great uh, uh, artists we have, I think, is the Philadelphia Wire Man, who nobody knows who it is. Found 1,200 pieces in a garbage can in 1982. Started to sell them. We've been buying. We've bought one a year in the last 26 years. We think that they relate to everything we have in the house. What we love about them is the fact that they're not about name because nobody knows who did it. It's not about money because they're not that expensive. Um, in fact, our first one cost us $125. Uh, but they're very powerful pieces. But that's not what we started with. And we changed it and said it fits. I studied art history in college, and it took me 10 years to unlearn everything I was taught in college. It was too close then when we started out. Do you, you know, you bring up the Philadelphia Wire Man, and these are Philadelphia Wire Man sculptures here that I'm pulling up some examples of. Um, in most cases, is it important to, and do you know the artist? I'm sorry, we didn't hear that. All the words didn't come through. Okay, how often do you know the artist? Pardon me? Do we know the artist? Yep. He was not, unknown. Not with a fill, you know, across the board. Got it up there. There you oh. go. There they are. Yes. 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 We could probably find no, a few of ours on there. Okay. Oh, probably. But, um, but I'm, I'm not thinking so much about the Philadelphia Wire Man, but I mean, of all the Chicago and other artists you own where the artist is known, do you know the artist often? We know a lot of the artists we collect. Uh, but uh, we generally like to look at art, and the only time we really ever made a mistake was when we met three artists that we loved, and we bought their work and took it home and didn't like it. We liked the artist. So we think that the work of art has to speak for itself. But I, my sense is, is that you often, after you, you know, after you own the work of art, that you have a dynamic relationship with the artist. Is that so? We're losing you. I'm sorry. We didn't, we didn't hear you. Okay. Um, let's just pause for a moment because I see some spinning here. Can you hear me, okay, Larry? Yes. Can you hear us? Yes. Do Do you have relationships with many artists? 
Well, you know, we've been collecting the, uh, oh, that's another thing I'd have to say about our collection. We have tried to buy the core of our collection. We've been buying the artists since they graduated college. So we, we have works of art by some artists for the last 50 years, maybe one every 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, last okay. 50 years. Okay. Um, we're that old. Yeah, we're that old. We're that old, right. Um, but yes, we know most of the artists now. And we're kind of settled in. Uh, uh, you know, you get old and uh, uh, your collection, I think, can take you over. Um, we still buy unknown artists. We've bought unknown artists our whole life. Uh, but they have a connection to us, and they have a connection to the other works of art. So, um, uh, yes, we do know the artists, and we, we know them well now, but many of the artists we collected, we can't even afford anymore, uh, but we know them. Some of them have died. What we did was we used to go to the opening on Friday nights. We would go, and we would go each month when there was openings. We were always going to art shows or during the week. And then the kids got older, we dragged them too. But we went and we saw the artwork and we didn't necessarily know the artists in the beginning. But as you keep coming, they, you know, everybody begins to know everybody. And then you kind of like know people and they know you. But we would go and we would, we would both go at different times. Ray would go before me because he was downtown. I would come later after a sitter. And he would pick out a work of art that he would like and put it away and not tell me. I put a hold on. I would look around and see what I'd like. And if it ended up being the same piece, we bought it. And mostly about 95% of the time, we chose the, individually. The piece I picked out, piece. put a hold on, usually was the piece that she picked when she went to the gallery. Yeah. So uh, we were very compatible. We've only bought two or three pieces. I've bought two or three pieces that she hates. Sure. Sure. Absolutely hate. <laughs> uh, we we like most of the art. Now we like all of our art, and we have everything we've ever bought, except for one artist. But that's another whole story. Um, <laughs> so you we, you wait, how many pieces? You said six hundred and fifty, and you own six hundred pieces. Now most of them are up. Some in the closet, but most are up. The walls are done. Yeah. What now, about your uh, friends? Are most of your friends also collectors or involved in the art to an extent? Or not always? No, not, we have friends who are collectors, but you know, in a, some sense, it's very competitive. Um, we all want the great piece, and um, uh, there aren't a lot of people that collect specifically what we collect. And for many years, um, uh, we've been kind of laughed at. Um, laughed at you? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, uh, they don't think, in fact, some of the newer things we've bought. Uh, one person came over to a house and said, oh, you know, that's not art. And I said, okay, it's not art. But that's a good we, sign. Got, yeah, we got that kind of response over the years. And now it's starting to uh, become significant because one of the things I think is very important in a, a work of art is that if it's really good, it gets better as it gets older. It keeps on speaking to you. And if it's not good, it becomes wallpaper. And what happens is you walk right past it and you don't look at it. You All know? right, well, exactly. But if that's the case, then why have you not via session sold, donated, gifted more pieces? Because we like almost every single thing we have. We do. And we look at it. Larry makes a tour every night to say goodbye. Good night to everybody. <laughs> but, uh, Welcome I, in. I, I, there's talkable people there. I got the tree man. I've got the naked lady. I've got all kinds of people in there. They all talk. I don't know what they talk no, about, but, but it's very good to hear. But over the years, the paintings have gotten better and better and yes. better. And sometimes now people will come, some museum will come from somewhere in the world and say, oh, you have that painting. Well, that's the painting nobody wanted to buy 40 years ago. They didn't want it. And now the museums are saying, oh, that's a good painting. Um, uh, paintings, I learned, have to carry on a dialogue. The artist has to create a vocabulary that he speaks with. And he has to create on the canvas or in what he does, he has to create a, a, a dialogue. And it has to ask questions, in my opinion. And those questions are answered by the viewer. And the viewer answers the questions with questions. It's very Talmudic. Uh, 
But a good work of art doesn't tell you everything. And in fact, sometimes the intentions of the artist weren't as great as the artwork becomes, or, were, or the intentions of the artist was greater than the painting actually is. Okay. But it becomes its own entity, and it no longer belongs to the painter, and it doesn't belong to the collector. It becomes... Do you, do you only purchase from art galleries? Um, mostly, we have honored the gallery system. We feel that galleries uh, usually show the better pieces. In fact, Evelyn was stating that we went to a, uh, uh, a fair and we went to the gallery and we realized that the work in the gallery by the same artist was better than the work at the fair. So but that's we, not so much what I meant, though. I appreciate that. But I mean, do you buy artwork ever that is not, the, the, the artist does not have any representation? Uh, we have. Yes, yes, we have. We, we have. Uh, of course, it's harder to find them. Uh, we're always looking. Um, we shouldn't be collecting anymore, but we still are. We haven't bought a work of art for a week. <laughs> <laughs> we we um, we have to do it. Uh, we reached a point in our life where that's who we are and that's what we do. I believe there are three kinds of collectors. There's the investor collector. He's the guy that buys something because he thinks it's going to go up in value faster or better than any other asset. And then there is the um, uh, the status collector. He's the person that made a lot of money in life and he wants to have status. So he buys those things that are in museums. Uh, usually, in my opinion, they end up with not great paintings, but paintings by great artists. But they don't want to take a chance. They want to make sure it's established. So yeah. that's a different right. thing. And then there's the third kind of collector, which I think we are, and those right. are collectors who have to do what they do. They have to do it. I mean, we have to live with art. I would rather buy a work of art than buy a car. In fact, we lived 17 years without a dining room table uh, because every time we went to buy one, we bought a painting. Uh, we we <laughs> ate on a car chair. Um, and we do that today. We live without things in order to buy art that speaks to the art we have. And we feel that when people come over the house, that some people leave a different person. And some people don't even see the art. Yeah, some people leave and they don't even know you have any art. Right. Isn't that bizarre? Mm -hmm. it's, yes, yes, it's bizarre. It's bizarre. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not uh, trying to give you a, a compliment. We come to your house. You have beautiful pieces of art. There is a way, of, there's just something when you look at a work of art, it's good or it's not good. It could be big, it could be expensive, it could be cheap, it could be unknown. There's good and there's not so good. And by the way, I also believe that you can learn as much about art from a bad work of art. It'll teach you what's not good. Yeah, but that's not as much fun. No. Well, it's always <laughs> but good. you're learning. Yeah. That's right. Look for you. So let me ask you a slightly loaded question here. <clears throat> I mean, I, when I had a gallery, some people would spend months buying art, I mean, pay for it over months, and some people would refuse to pay, do payments and they'd only you know, purchase it if they could take it home that day, or you know, or only purchase, you know, they'd pay for it and full up front. Um, do you have a policy about that? <laughs> we have owed for art for 55 years. Always, our monthly bill, you know, when we were younger, everybody had a Marshall Fields credit card and they had a Marshall Fields bill every month. We had an art bill every month. We we always bought uh, on time because... If we could pay for it up front, we would, but we were, you know... We, you know, if you do the math, we bought a work of art every month since we're married. So, you're right, isn't it? And you're exactly right. Yeah, you know, so we always owed on art and... Um, we always try to buy the smallest piece for the least amount of money that said the most. And the dealers went along because you're compared, you're going back and you're there and they see you and they want to encourage you too. It's business for them. It was love for us. Now, we have a painting that's seven feet by seven mm -hmm. feet. So you can imagine how much we like that painting. Um, we actually brought it home and, and had it in our house for one month before we decided that we could live with it. And then we hung it up 
and it is one of the greatest paintings in our house. Uh, we've had it for almost 30 years. It's very powerful. Uh, it says a lot. We learn things every day. We see uh, little uh, notations and things in the paintings that the artist did that we didn't know he did, and we learn to know the arts, and that's how we really learn who the artists were, by looking at their works of art. It was something you would have done. It was the dealer who let us have this for a month and encouraged us because we were wondering, could we, could we, could we not? And so she said, okay, let's take it home and see what you think. And that's what we did, and then we loved it. Now, every now and then, once we had a dealer who sold a piece of somebody near us, and the person decided he didn't want it. She called us up and she said, it's so expensive to move. How about if I drop it off at your house and you look at it? And we looked at it and we loved it. it. How often did you take work home on approval? How, not, no, um, not a lot. No. Most of the time, we would walk it. What we do. That big what, one was the first one. That, that one was so that tough. That was so tough. That we, we didn't know if we could live with it. Right. But we would go to six or eight shows a night and go home. And if we didn't wake up in the middle of the night saying, maybe somebody's in the gallery right now at 3 o'clock in the morning, find it, we would wake up and the first thing we'd call and say, we want that painting. Uh, yeah, I got some of those calls. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then, but mostly we knew what we wanted. I will tell you this story that we once bought a painting. We had a dinner engagement. We walked into the gallery on the way to the dinner engagement. I took one look, <laughs> picked the painting. It was spectacular. It was the best painting in the gallery. Uh -huh. Well, a month later, we took it home. And the minute we got it in the house, we said, uh, this is a one-liner. Oh, my God. What did we do? You know what a one-liner is? It's a painting that you look at once. It makes your heart palpitate. You're never going to look at it again. It doesn't say anything. Yep. And I was cleaning it off. Well, the dealer called me at the end of the month and said, I really would like the money because I have another person who wants it. I said, well, I can't pay you off, uh, but if you got somebody who wants to buy it, I'll bring it back. I got in the car. I got it back so fast. It's unbelievable. Well, I didn't want the painting, but we were, we were going to honor our commitment and keep it. You know, sometimes I would call someone who owed me money and say something exactly like that without another client in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, almost never did anybody call us, and they knew that we may go there a month later and buy a second painting and pay that one off too. Um, sometimes we have bought some things. Uh, in fact, the most expensive thing we ever bought, uh, we went to Art Expo, uh, and I was saying to Evelyn, I, I'm beginning not to understand what, what art is. And we walked around the bend, and we took one look at this piece, and I said, oh, we know what art looks like. We Here know it what it looks like. And we bought it. And it was very expensive, and we paid for it. Now, so when you, travel, when, you, when you travel, when you go to Russia or whatever, do you look at art in other places? Yes. Always. Yes. In fact, we almost never go anywhere uh, without it being uh, uh, a destination to look at, at art. We... Uh, uh, we had the fortune of being able to publish an art book in 1980 on Chicago art with the British Museum chain. And we went to uh, England, and one of the people involved in the book uh, was an assistant to Henry Moore. And he took us to his home in Butch Haddon. We spent the day with Henry Moore on his 100-acre uh, uh, estates with uh, all the eight buildings and 28 people working for him. Every artist should, should have met. Henry Moore or somebody like him when he's alive. The one artist that we sold, I might as well tell you, I went to a show in New York and I saw this artist there who I love and he sold $900,000 worth of art in one week and his stuff was not good. And out of protest, we, uh, we exchanged the five paintings that we owned for a painting by another artist. And uh, unfortunately, I probably should have kept them and the other artist, but I didn't have the money. And we were able to trade the five paintings for the one painting. Am I unhappy? Not unhappy. It was part of our life. I'm sorry we don't have him. I don't think he ended up being a great artist, although he sold a lot of work in his, in his life. He was a very successful artist financially. I don't think he 
he created great works of art. It happens that the five pieces we own were when he was very young, and I think they were great. Uh, but that that happens. So you know, if, uh, if people have questions, start putting up your hands, and I will start um, calling you. Um, people put up hands up there. Um, but mostly you don't buy, well, I don't know, maybe you do. Do you buy art outside the United States much? Uh, no. We also don't travel much out of the United States much. Anymore. Anymore. Uh, but no, we, we basically decided to buy a, a certain genre of arts. It is uh, what you would call American uh, realism. Uh, you know, the pop artists, um, uh, the Chicago artists uh, have worked in more of a, a an American vernacular. Um, so we are, you used to go to you used to, you used to go to Moscow a lot. For, yes. for uh, and did you ever think about building a Soviet Russian collection of swords? Yeah, or? Yes, never saw anything we really liked. Yeah. Um, some artists became famous by uh, after glass now selling. And at, in uh, Switzerland, and they became very well known. I thought they were somewhat derivative. I think a lot of the art there was derivative. And of course, one of the problems in collecting art is that you know right now there's somebody doing something that's spectacular, but you don't know where it is or who he is, or, and so you don't get to. So through the the system, you get to see art that is saleable uh, generally, and so. You get to see things. Some of them are derivative. Uh, uh, some of them are very good. But we ended up collecting what we grew up with in our life. A, a lot of our art has to do with comic books, uh, circuses, uh, popular kind of uh, thing, neon, uh, things like that. And they all, they're all they all full of color and uh, a little bit strange in a way. Um, we have some very sexually uh, explicit pieces uh, because we think that we started collecting uh, during the sexual uh, revolution with the invention of the birth control pill. Uh, and it, we think it ended in the late 80s uh, with AIDS. AIDS stopped it. And it doesn't mean that it stopped art. It just stopped the kind of art that we were buying. Uh, it was a, it came out of Playboy magazine and, and uh, Esquire, the Smarts at the University of Chicago. Um, there was something that was going on in Chicago, and it came from the school of the Art Institute and all the teachers who all knew each other. So I think there is a tie uh, between most of the art that we we collect. Every now and then we find an artist outside of Chicago, like um, uh, Daniel Spreck in Denver, Colorado, or um, uh, uh, Willie Cole from New Jersey. Or um, 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 John D'Andrea? Uh, no, from California, the famous uh, artist. William Wiley. William Wiley. <laughs> Wiley was a friend of all these artists, so we have a William Wiley. Um, there are other artists I love and would love to have, can't afford them. You couldn't afford them. Um, so we do look at young artists. We have friends who have met someone and they have let us in, meet them, they sent them over, and so we have met some people, we bought some things. But, you know, the gallery system in a way tells you that they've been vetted a little bit, and so that makes it easier, just as the curator was talking about for we've, her purposes. We've seen art at other uh, collectors' houses. Right. Uh, we went to Linda Kramer's house, and she had a little thing on the floor, and I said, that's fabulous, who is it? She told me, we called him up, we went to his house, and over a period of about six, seven years, we bought 69 pieces. He's the artist that friends come over and say, oh, you know, that's not art. We think they're terrific. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. He makes stainless steel jewelry boxes. Some look like Carol Worsnum. Mm -hmm. uh, they look like uh, other artists, and they fit in with the Philadelphia Wireman. <laughs> Johnny, you got a question or a comment? Go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Larry and Evelyn. I just wanted to ask um, really quick uh, if uh, legacy comes into any of your thoughts, um, you know, after um, 
after you're gone from this world, what will happen with your collection? Does it does it concern you at all? Uh, ter terribly. Uh, and it, it concerns us because we're getting older because um, our children are not interested in our art. Um, and our problem is that we didn't buy for investment. We bought because of uh, naive love. And we love living with our stuff. We just as soon stay home and be with all of our things. We, we feel very comfortable. And so we don't want to deal with the accessing. And in fact, we're doing something that's probably not very nice. Uh, we're giving all of our art to our children and let them do with it what they want. If they want to sell it, they can sell it. Uh, if they want to give it away. We think it is a significant collection uh, that really says something about the condition of art. It is not the most powerful, the most expensive, it, but it does speak. As a unit, the whole thing the whole is thing. a unit. It's when important. we've had people come into our house, I'll tell you a fast story. A salesman wants to sell me something. My office was five blocks from my house. It was noisy. I said, let's go home. We come in the house. He says, do you collect art? Do you mind if I look? He walks around for two hours, and he puts on his coat, and he starts to leave. I said, wait a second, you came here to sell me something. He says, something happened to me today. I don't want to talk about anything. I just want to leave. And he left. <laughs> and I never saw him again. So we think, but then we're, we're prejudiced. We're, we're also, we believe in ourselves. We believe in what we do. Uh, I will say this, that a successful businessman, many, will build collections that they would never make those decisions in their business, but they allow a third party to tell them what is good art, and they put together a collection that is not at all about them or their sensibility, but it's about power, it's about money, and that's what I meant about the investment collector or the status collector. But I think that you have to buy things that speak to you, and you don't care what's going to happen to them, but you feel comfortable with them. And I would say this, we have 118 artists in our collection. I think two of the 118 are no longer painting after 50 years. Two, all the others are still painting, and teaching, and I think that's very significant. But it's been a burden. I mean, we feel it on our shoulders yeah. about what we're going to do with this, and we look around us, and yes. It and we is, don't like what the government is, yeah. is doing. The government is saying, uh, if you collect and you amass something that is significant, we are going to take it away from you. And if it's not significant, you can keep it. And that's what's happening. Now, we've had several museums that have looked at our collection and would like it. But there are a couple of problems. One is most museums would put it in the basement and never show it, number one. And then two. Come out, come out, come out, come out. I want, I want to point out that 90, the average is like excess of 90% of work owned by museums in the world, 90% never sees the light of day. That's right. That's right. Um, we were with the head of the Guggenheim about 15 years ago. He said that they had uh, 325 Kandinsky's, but they couldn't show all of them. Every time they brought a painting from their warehouse, it cost them $10,000. And that was 30 or 35 years ago. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, now, they would show them if we gave them 20 or $30 million endowing. endowing the collection, then maybe they would show it. That's going to my kids. So. Cool. All right. Um, Jen, your turn. <laughs> I was curious, uh, the name of the artist that made that seven by seven painting that you fell so in love with. I'd like his to see the work. Name is Jim Lutz. He's a professor at the School of the Art Institute, and we now own five paintings by him, and they are fabulous. I think he's a great artist. He's had two books published on him in the last two years. The Smart Gallery had a, a retrospective on him. I think he's a very complex artist, and I think his work is terrific. Thank you. 
Lutz, L-U-T-E-S. I was going to pull up an image, but I don't want to stick on that one point so long. Cool. Thank you, Jen. Um, Kevin, go ahead. Hi, uh, Evelyn and Larry. Um, thanks for being on the call. Uh, my question is, uh, a lot of artists uh, tend to move to uh, the coasts, uh, you know, to make their career. Um, and a lot of collectors also either, either. work from the coasts. Um, yeah. How do you uh, see us keeping artists here in Chicago and, and local collectors buying local art? How do I feel about it? How do you see it? How, do you, how does one augment that? How does one augment people supporting their own? How do you get people to support local artists, and how do you keep the local artists in Chicago rather than move? Thank you. Our collection is an accident. There are a lot of artists we'd love to have that we don't have for many reasons. We either couldn't afford it. By the way, we built our collection on a budget. We don't have unlimited funds. So we've always had to make a decision. But um, being an accidental collection, we don't try to deal with who lives where, who, who does what. We believe that something happened in Chicago that is not yet recognized internationally. It's starting to. There are two museums in the United States that are trying to collect these artists. One is the Pennsylvania uh, Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, Pennsylvania uh, Academy of Fine Arts, right? Uh, yeah, Academy. Right. And the other is uh, uh, in Madison. And uh, we've talked to them, we go and see them, we see their art. Um, but um, we do see West and East Coast art. It does come to Chicago. We haven't gone to New York that much. We've gone to Los Angeles. But we're the center. It does get here filtered out, I guess, somewhat. And yes, actually, the best stuff didn't come here. And some artists couldn't understand why they were so popular. And then when we saw their work, because little of it came here, we understood. No, I look and but, see. Um, we never okay. saw great works of art by Roy Lichtenstein early on. Uh, now that we see uh, his work at, in museums, it's fabulous. But we didn't get a chance to get a great work of art. We never wanted a work of art that was by a big name. Wanted, that wasn't a great work of art. We wanted great works of art. And I believe a great work of art could be created by anybody. And in fact, I think Picasso killed most artists. Because he's, he's the only artist who changed his style his whole life and was always great. Um, but I think that if an artist creates one work of art that is memorable, he belongs in the annals of the history of art. And I'd like it. That's okay, and we'd like to have, yeah. for example, uh, Nighthawks, one of the great paintings. American Gothic, one of the great paintings. Uh, these, these are icons. We happen to feel we have maybe seven or eight icons that would hold up with uh, with uh, American Gothic or Nighthawks. And, uh, but no, nobody's um, really interested in it. What makes a painting go up a lot in terms of money? Three multi-millionaires with big egos who want the same work of art. That will make a work of art sell for $100 million. But a great work of art that is only wanted by one person, not going to sell for a lot of money. And the relationship between money and paintings, there is no relationship. Just because a painting is expensive does not mean it's great. Just because a painting is inexpensive does not mean it's, it's bad. And we keep on looking for what we think are wonderful little gems. And I think that we've been very fortunate in getting, I would say uh, we have 100 pieces that I would kill for, okay? And, and, and you have a couple, Paul, in the middle yeah, of the night. We'll come, in your house. <laughs> we'll come in your house and say, you know, while we're having dinner, may steal something. Right. <laughs> and now I know where that missing piece went. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Collecting is very competitive. You don't have to collect. It's all about avarice, greed, envy. It's about a lot of bad emotions. You can go to museums and see great works of art. But we have to live with great works of art. That's our, I call it a curse, call it whatever you want. That's what we want out of our life. And we paid for it. It hasn't been easy, uh, but it's wonderful. That's cool. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I only see one more hand. If somebody else wants to ask more questions, raise your hands, please. Go ahead, Barry. Hey, I, I 
had a couple questions. So, I do see more hands. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you had mentioned Madison as being one of the places that uh, had a museum. They want, they want to collect Chicago art. I'm sorry? They want to collect Chicago art. I yes. Think. Okay. So are you referring to the Chazen Museum or the uh, Amoka? No. No, the Steve Fleischmann's. Uh, it used to be called the Madison Art Center. It's yeah. now, I don't know what it's called. Yeah. Now, we were just there. We were we're just there. Just yeah. yeah. I'd like to meet you sometime. I live there. It's very nice. Very nice. Uh, I had one other question. Uh, have yeah. you ever been to the Circus World Museum in Baraboo? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, we've been to the Ringling uh, uh, Museum. Uh, we have one of the great circus tent sides. We have a circus tent side done by um, um, Wyatt. By, by um, Snap Fred, Wyatt or something? Fred Johnson. Fred Johnson. Fred Johnson. Um, Randy Johnson's father of Snap Wyatt, the uh, tattoo artist. We bought it because we thought. Snap Wyatt did circus tent side. Uh, uh, Stony St. Clair. Stony St. Clair, I'm sorry. Um, uh, we bought it because it looked like a Ed Paschke, and um, it's a wonderful piece. Uh, there have been three museum shows that they use that piece for, for the museum museum show. Let me let me say one one comment. Uh, if you're an artist and you're doing a work of art, you should always ask yourself, why am I doing this? Am I saying something? Is it just pretty? Does it? Because if it's just pretty, if it doesn't say anything, it's going to become wallpaper. And one of the things we look at when we look at a painting is, does this painting speak to us? Why do we want to own it? Why can't we just look at it? Why do we feel the necessity to possess it? Because that's a whole different emotion. You know, because you don't have to collect. You can love art. You can go look at art. So we have something else in our DNA. But I think that an artist has to create a vocabulary, and then he has to tell a story. He has to say something. He has a condition, uh, and that that has to be done in the form of a question. And that question gets answered by the viewer in the form of questions. And so, a good work of art is something that a, a person creates and a person looks at, and it becomes more important because the two people are interconnected. It's not just uh, a sheet of paper or a canvas. And in fact, I think that it's very difficult for an artist. I won a scholarship in painting and drawing to the Art Institute when I was a kid. I can't be a great artist. I also studied art history in college. And I learned that art history is something made by intellects and people involved in, in the industry, but it for example, we went to um, uh, to um, Helsinki and saw a painting done in the same year that uh, uh, Munch did Geschrei. And it was every bit as good as Geschrei. It's not as well known. It was done by some uh, a Finnish artist in 1893, the same year that uh, Geschrei was done. World class painting. We photographed it, took it home. We look at it every now and then. But I think it's difficult for a person to stretch a canvas or take a piece of material and create a world and tell a story in that world with a vocabulary that he created that is understandable by the viewer. And I think that's really what art is about. Cool. All right. John, you have a question. Go ahead, please. Yeah, what can you share who that uh, the name of the artist that does the uh, stainless steel jewelry boxes that you everybody says well, is not about seventy feet. Uh, unfortunately, he died six months ago or a year ago. His name was Stanley Swark, and he was a metal worker. And Linda Kramer, who was the Chicago artist, saw something in him, and I saw something in him. And how did we end up with sixty-nine pieces? People would come to our house and say, oh, I like that. Would you take us to meet the artist? So we would take them to meet the artist, and we'd buy another two or three pieces. 
we ended up buying 69 pieces before he died. It was amazing the presents he got and everybody who walked in the house and looked at them. They wanted them. Now, I don't know if it's art. Is there anything on the internet of pictures of his stuff or no? Um, well, well, we'll take a piece and show it to you. Well, well thank you. Here's a piece. Can you see that? I oh, know you're not showing a oh. picture. Can you? Yeah. Can you? Yeah, we can see it. I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I live in, I live in Bolivia, so it's, I'm, I'm, uh, challenged. <laughs> my, uh, this my, is a stainless is, steel, oh. it's a stainless steel jewelry box. Yeah, and I love it. He welded onto it pieces of stainless steel and he painted it. Stampings. He put stampings. These are stampings in. that come off of metal stampings. It's something he picks it up off the floor in the metal shop. Yeah. We have sixty nine, we have some terrific pieces, but of the pieces we have, they speak to us. They're not we we saw other pieces that he had. We we didn't we didn't like them. Um um, you know, it's nice having a camera. We could show uh, uh, other pieces. It would be yeah, nice to walk do. around the house and, and, and show you. Uh, hey, you, guys run, you guys run a desktop and not a portable, right? Well, I'm, this is. Oh, it is, yeah. it is a portable. Yeah. Example, here is a self portrait of uh, Ray Oshida. Can you see that? Can you see yeah. that? Very nicely. A little bit, we're a little close, but yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's as far as it goes. Okay, you now, much more. over here is the piece. Can you see the Carl Wilson cutout? Yep. Yeah. The seven foot cutout called Aqua Dick by Carl Wilson, found in 1971. We're up in a bedroom, and there's our old <laughs> In one of our kids' bedrooms. Well, they're all nobody, nobody lives there. Cool. Does somebody else want to ask a question? I don't know if I see any more hands after John's. What, John? What's that? Do you have any, do you want to follow up? Do you have anything more to say? Is it, its name is Schwartz. S W A R K. S S D C W. Wait a second. S W A R Z. It's it's Schwartz. Schwartz. It means Stanley. He, he, he was Polish who lived in the German part of Poland during the Second World War. Oh wow! Yeah, he must have been interesting too. Schwartz, Schwartz, yeah. uh, okay. Stanley Schwartz. And uh, if you look up at um, um, uh, Paul, help me. What's the gal What's the uh, auction house in in uh, Atlanta? The, Atlanta? Uh, yeah, the Outsider Arts. Gallery. I don't know the answer. Um, oh well. Okay, I'll get it for you. Go we'll have it for next show. Thank Somebody you. from Thank the Army. Hold on. Thank you very much. For information. Thank you. Thank you too, John. Uh, uh, anyhow, it's um, somebody from the Army. Four Seasons? King Galleries? Slotin. Slotin. Auctioneers in Atlanta recently sold five or six of his pieces. Uh, somebody from the Art Institute got them, and he donated them to the Art Institute, and they sold them. Cat uh, Chow is another artist. You know Cat Chow. Uh, I do. Yes. He moved to New York. She, by the way, I, I think that the great art right now in Chicago is being done by Nick Cave's department at the Art Institute. The uh, fabric, textile, costume department is doing some great work. We've bought a piece from Kat Chow and from Mark Newport, who's up in the uh, Northwest, mm -hmm. who graduated. And a small McCabe. Yeah, we have a small McCabe. Um, 
but not like yours. Paul, you have a great Nick Cage. You know, the only way I could get that was to participate in the Hyde Park Arts Center is not just another pretty face thing, because it was the only way to get something small that I could afford. That's right. right. And, and it was, it's wonderful. And, it's, and he's a great artist, and you have a great piece. Well, thank you. And I next week we need to do a webinar with us, but I still, we haven't ever coordinated. I keep, you know, we keep missing one another. Um, I don't know if we have more questions. I had one. Mm. Oh, do you, has, has, has the internet impacted your collecting or your pursuit of information and how you learn or follow art? The internet. Pardon me? Do you follow art on the internet? Yeah, how does the internet affect your collecting? We, we, if you're asking me, do we follow art on the internet? We will look up galleries, uh, and in fact, today you almost don't have to go to the shows. You can just look up in the gallery. Uh, one of the things I did for the Philadelphia Wire Man is I would go to uh, Fleischer Ullman Gallery every six months and look and see what he had there, and if I saw something I liked, I'd buy it. So we, you know, we can't go where we work. We do whatever we can to be involved with art. So there's dialogue that goes on with other people. They say they saw something. There, you do whatever you have to do, uh, but it has become our life, and so we're we're always doing it. Wonderful. I see two people with their hands up, but I think their hands were up from long ago. Jen, do you have a comment or question? Oh no. I didn't Sorry. think so. I wanted to be sure. And Sal, what about you? You're good? Do you have a question? Do you have a question? Do, yes. Great. Tell us. I was, I was curious. Um, in, I, I've heard in circumstances in, like with photography collectors that um, often they're open to meeting with um, artists and looking at a portfolio. And I'm wondering if, if you've ever done that, worked with artists in that regard, or do you um, pretty much only work through uh, finding art in galleries and in other... Um, well, we have looked at portfolios of artists, but for me, it's it's a little bit embarrassing because it's it's you can't say you don't like it. You can't say anything because the fact that I don't like something doesn't mean it's not great. I've missed, you know, it takes two hours for me to tell you all the works of art I missed, all the artists I've missed. Um, so but in actuality, we were at an artist studio one month ago and went through a whole portfolio with the artist at her studio. But we do do that. We do. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's a little harder. You know what's hard is when an artist what, what's hard is if an artist comes to you and says, what do you think of my things? I virtually never answer them. I say, it's not important what I think. It's important what you think. Um, but there's something presumptuous about me saying, I think it's good or not good. Uh, I don't think that's meaningful. I know things that I connect with that's very personal. That's all it is, is personal. And that, that's, that's how it should be, I think. I mean, I think people who are trying to invest with art or something like that, or you now they're, they're buying art with somebody else's taste in mind. That seems like really silly. Right, right. And you know, Paul, that a lot of people do that. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I was in New York once. I will not mention the person's name. I literally tell you, he was the third biggest art collector in the United States. And there was a show of an artist that was a friend of mine, and he had a hold on a piece, and he said, Larry, I had just met him, what do you think of this painting? And I said, what do you think of the painting? If you like it, you should buy it. I know what he was asking me. He was asking me, do I think it's going to go up in value? I wasn't going to answer that, and I wasn't going to answer him as to whether, if he asked me would I buy the painting, I might say, no, I wouldn't buy that painting. I'd buy a different painting. But it's not meaningful, um, and it's somewhat embarrassing. So it becomes very personal, and it's something we're becoming more um, uh, loners as we get older, and we want less opinions, and, and we want to go to less shows. We want to find things through magazines or, or uh, 
uh, through uh, word of mouth or something like that. But I think that's the role of a good dealer. A good dealer will tell the artist what he thinks, and they have a real historical background or code, whatever the art gallery person has. And I think their their ideas, when they want to bring an artist along and help them out, will be truthful and honest. And I think that's probably what you'd like. I think what Evelyn is saying is that mm. what Evelyn is saying is that a dealer can play an important yeah. part in a collector by trying to explain to the collector why that collector should look at that work of art or why it's relevant to what the collector is collecting. And a dealer can help a lot in doing that. But he does it also for the artist. He does the collector. All right, let me ask the last question. And you, know, you mentioned magazines and stuff. How much reading do you do to stay abreast of what's going on in art or for art historical purposes? Uh, we, we read a lot. Go to lectures. We go to lectures. <laughs> we go to shows. Mm -hmm. The show at the Art Institute right now, the Picasso show, is spectacular. And you learn, looking at Picasso, you can learn how other art, for example, in the Picasso show, we saw eight or nine of our artists. We saw relevant things that related between Picasso and them. And I'm sure that they saw these works and they experimented with them. There's nothing wrong with that. No, of course not. That said, I see more questions. Bill, go ahead. I just wanted to, it's not a uh, question, it's a, com it's a comment. And I just wanted to thank uh, Larry and Evelyn because you're the kind of collectors that I want to create work for. You may not collect what I create, but I appreciate the personal passion that you have for collecting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Bill, that's, that's, and everybody else, that's part of the reason that I'll ask Evelyn and Larry to participate with us tonight. Because way too many artists realize that collectors have a really sympathetic, comparable passion that artists have. And I mean, you know, I think Larry and Evelyn are exceptional on one hand. And on the other hand, they're not that exceptional. There are other collectors that have, you know, a, a, a like passion. Let me tell you a fast story. We were not on our house in 1980. We put up our works of art and we decided to invite 28 artists to our house that had work in our collection and were friends with each other. And we invited one other couple, a friend of ours. The 28 artists came in the house, they walked around and they didn't say a word. And the two people that we invited, our friends, they said, I think you guys made a mistake. You shouldn't have been <laughs> down there. And it was like death. That was awful. Oh. And we sat down and had dinner. And I got up and I said, I know you're all wondering uh, why I invited you here. I, there's no reason other than we just finished remodeling our house. The paint is beautiful. The floors are beautiful. We hung up all the paintings. And we wanted you to see your paintings in a home environment. And then they all started to laugh and they said, we were intimidated because we had never seen our art with our friends' art. They had never seen it in a house with all the other art. And they were intimidated by it. And the rest of the evening, everybody laughed and talked. I thought that was very interesting. We thought we yeah, made me too. Yeah. We <laughs> also had we had Jim Lutz over our house uh, once, and uh, he won a um, grant to go to Europe, and he didn't have money in his dealer clothes. So we got four of our friends, and we went and bought five paintings so that he'd have enough money to spend six months in Europe. When he came back, we said, how would you like to have a progressive dinner? We'll go to everybody's house, and you'll see your painting painting. He walks into our house. We have three paintings hanging next to Roger Brown and Ed Paschke, and uh, he, he takes a look, he says, oh my God, I'm an imagist. He said, I thought I was an abstractionist. He said, but when I see the paintings in context with the images, I realize why everybody says I'm an imagist. He didn't even realize. He wrote us a letter and said, thank you for opening my eyes to, to me seeing my own works of art in a different manner.
I thought that was unbelievable. I bet I have some pictures of your collection. Hold on. I know I do. Wait a minute. Here's a. Well, do you have hairy armpits? Oh, this is opening all too, all so, too slow. No, I see what's happening. Do you have Armando? By Ed Paschke? No. No, I just have you guys sitting near the fireplace. Oh, well, oh yeah. Yeah, there. yeah, there's a lot of. Yeah, we, we have about 100 pieces in there. There should be a rad stuff around there. Um, hold on. See, so, they, you know. I mean, there's a Roger Brown above your head, and there's who's the two faces to the left, to your right, our left. Okay. Oh, there's the Jim Lutz on the left. This one. That, that's the seven foot painting that we took home and okay. spent the months before we bought it. And, there, and on the, the back of the fireplace is the Philadelphia Wireman. Next to Larry is uh, a part of the, yeah, the William, the William Wiley. Wiley. There's a, a drawing that goes with it. Above it is the Roger Brown. There's, uh, there's a Jim, Jim Ross, Ross, and there's a, um, um, a Marcus Subaru. And, um, and um, a piece of Terry Carpowitz, right? Uh, uh, Margaret Morton, another Jim Nuts, uh, Don Baum, Chris Avarda. A Greek artist. Don't even start with that. <laughs> but, um, how many? Yeah. How many? I took this picture maybe two years ago. How many? How many of these pieces are in the same place? How many pieces of what? Have you rehung any of these? Have you rehung? Okay, we, we, we don't that's just down now. You say it again. Have you rehung any of these pieces? How, how many what? Have you rehung them, or are they all still there? They're, they're oh, oh, that, pretty much there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. another thing that's interesting. Um, we have tried to hang every room so that they're not rehangable. In other words, every painting speaks to every other piece in the room. So that um, uh, our theory was, if we got the whole house to be exactly the way it should look, that we would have to move and start all over again. See, once you move one painting, you have to move everything else because they do speak to each other. Good point. Um, John, did you have another question? Oh, no, I actually you answered it. I wanted to know how involved you got with the artists mm -hmm. that you collect, and it's obvious that you spent a lot of time with them. I think that's wonderful. Later on, not in the beginning. Not in the beginning, but now, yes, they're all friends of ours. In fact, Roger Brown's companion was an architect, and he's the one who redesigned our house. Right. So he designed it knowing that um, it was all going to be about art. And if you look at the furniture in their room, there really was no furniture. There was all art objects that were created for the room. That's wonderful. Uh, we have very, very little furniture in the house. <laughs> Great. That's really true, except around the dining room table. <laughs> Sit around the, and the dining room table our Mies van der Rohe, Bernot chairs, from the original plans at Skidmore Owen from Mies van der Rohe, because George Rodder, who designed our house, worked for Mies van der Rohe. And um, George designed the table to match the chairs because Mies van der Rohe never made a table. Uh, in fact, that's another funny story. We found uh, an oriental rug that Nixon brought to the United States when he came from China, and we said to George, we want you to see this rug. And he went to the place and he looked at it and he said, that is the most beautiful oriental rug that is not going to be in your house. <laughs> and we never got it. And in fact, he bought a rug for us that my mother-in-law came over and she said, oh, I see you got the underlayment. When is the rug coming? Because he wanted it to disappear because he wanted you only to be able to see the art. The furniture had to disappear so that only the art was visible, which is what it is. Yeah. Okay. All right, you guys, you're wonderful, and we love you, and it's fabulous to know that the passion that art collectors have. And I'm going to unmute everybody so that I can all echo my sentiment. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And tell everybody here. Tell everybody here. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So, uh,
we'll touch soon. We're going to another ga a gallery on Wednesday, the Chicago folks, and I will send you in.